Let's um, continue with the second talk for today. So um, it's a pleasure to have um, Joan Simone telling us about aspects of the first law of complexity. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to join, first of all, uh, I would like to join uh, uh, the other speakers uh, by, by thanking the organizers to, uh, for organizing this, this, this great workshop also because these are very difficult times and so I, I would actually like to thank the, the entire community to continue doing a great and very inspiring and exciting work because somehow at least personally this helps me to keep myself with high spirits during these uh, very hard times for, for all of us. So uh, I, will, I will be reporting on, on, in so, uh, on some work uh, done in collaboration with uh, Alicia Bernamonti, Federico Galli, Juan Hernandez, uh, Ron Myers, Shaming Ruan and myself on, on some uh, considerations on, uh, on the first law of complexity, which, which I'll, 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 I'll define in shortly. Uh, this is not moving. Uh, okay, sorry, hopefully, yeah. So, uh, I thought that I would start by, this is mainly for uh, people not working in, in holography, to, to highlight a little bit of uh, the important impact that quantum information has had in recent years uh, uh, in, in in gravitational aspects in physics, which we refer to, to holography. The idea of CFT correspondence by, by Juan Maldacena is, is an explicit realization of, of the original holographic principle ideas developed by Tov and Saskin. Of course, this has a lot of history involving black hole physics, Bekenstein, Hawking, etc. So I'm being extremely uh, unfair and not historic. And just to highlight a little bit, this has been highlighted, of course, in, in the excellent talks by Rob and and, uh, and other speakers. Some of the fundamental personal bias insights uh, that, that this has come about is, is the amazing relation between geometry and quantum information notions such as entanglement entropy and the famous Ryutakayanagi formula. And perhaps at a more uh, conceptual or inspirational level, this, this, this idea that uh, space itself is, is basically a manifestation of quantum correlations through entanglement that uh, Mark Van Ramsdon put forward, which has been pushed forward into the slogan of EPR equals ER in, in, in more recent times. But now, just moving forward to the subject of, of this workshop and taking advantage of the excellent job that other speakers have made, uh, it was, it was basically pointed out by, by, by Lenny Saskin that if you study the geometry of the, the black hole interior, uh, these, these extremal surfaces grow in time, as, as Pavel have, has also stressed in, in the nice work by Maldacena and Harman, they, they, they see this uh, linear growth in time. And an easy question uh, that was asked by, by Lenny was, what is it that is growing? And indeed, uh, he, he came up with the proposal that it was uh, complexity. Uh, now, just to set the, I know that Pavel has also said this, but just to, to, to set the stage for my talk, I'll, of course, I'll, I'll take advantage of the excellent job that Pavel uh, made for all of us. Uh, what I will mean by complexity, uh, to some extent in this talk, is, is really quantum circuit complexity. So I'm, I'm thinking of this, what Jan has referred to this mysterious uh, reference state. Uh, but in principle, for now, this reference state could be any state of your, of, of your choice. And then you ask how you can generate some uh, target state uh, that I will refer with uh, xi of t uh, by means of acting with some unitary operators, which are generated by some uh, elementary gates. Now, the idea here is that you define this notion of a complexity of formation, if you want, as, uh, as the cost of the optimal circuit that generates this, this target space, uh, sorry, this target state for, for a given uh, reference state. So, so the, the crucial idea is uh, you are interested in the optimal circuit and you want to quantify the cost uh, to do that. I think I will have some problems here, maybe my computer is too slow. Okay, now uh, perhaps, uh, 
from my perspective, since I'm more uh, interested in 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 ADS CFT, um, I would like to stress uh, some point, which maybe it, 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 it's left implicit in many of our discussions, which is the fact that uh, quantum information has had uh, an enormous uh, conceptual uh, impact in in the way in which we we think about certain standard questions in high energy physics. Just to give a little bit of a flavor of what I have just said, but rephrasing it a little bit, we, we typically probe our states in terms of correlation functions. We, we have been very interested definitely in distinguishing different states uh, and how to probe the, the, the differences between them. Now, notice that in this definition of complexity, you are, you are focusing more your attention on how you generate these states from some reference state, so you are interested in identifying some optimal ways of generating this, like in the path integral optimization that Pavel was, was reviewing. You are asking more explicitly about what is the optimal way of generating this wave function, or even simulating this wave function like in tensor networks. Now, uh, I think that something that I will try to come back by the end of the talk, if I get there, because I was asked to come up with some speculative uh, remarks, is that the, the fact that we are asking questions of how difficult or not it is to generate some, some states, it also stresses a little bit more the relevance of which transformations are you going to use. Uh, and in particular, if you are interested in holography, as, as I think that's at least how I was understanding uh, some of Pavel's remarks, uh, uh, it, 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 it's non-trivial how these transformations have any realization in, in, in the bulk geometry. So, 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 so understanding these issues actually can help us to, to improve the dictionary. Sorry. Yeah. For uh, me, the audio is breaking up a little bit. Is that only me or do others have this issue? I think it might be on uh, John's side. It's, uh, it's breaking for me as well. Okay. Is it working or not? Uh, sorry. Now I think it's working, but if a minute for a okay. minute you are if breaking not, up a little. Okay, l l let me know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and of course we can ask these questions. Uh, notice that at this point, even though of course the motivation was originally for black hole physics, uh, at, at this point you are asking generic questions about genetic states. It doesn't have to be the, the black hole necessarily. Of course, it's very interesting to do it for that case. Uh, so all, all these questions suggest that there may be some, let me use the word observable, uh, 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 there, is a, there may be a new observable in town and whenever there is a new observable it's, it's extremely natural for, from a physicist's perspective to, to compare the, the answers for these observables for different states. That's a little bit uh, one of the motivations of what I would like to, to talk about. Now, um, in fact, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the possible relation of complexity with, uh, let's say, thermodynamics, in, in one of the original works by Brown and Saskin, they were already suggesting that there may be a relation between complexity and, and, and a resource, uh, and I'm really using the word resource in the same way as in Junger, Halper, and Stolk. Uh, think about it as some kind of a free energy if you want to. They were suggesting, the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, I was starting to suggest that it's a good idea to compare complexities. They, they coined the notion of uncomplexity to be the difference between the maximal complexity and the complexity of some given state, uh, let's call it rho. And uh, in the set, they were already providing some, uh, some intuition that the resource may be related coming back to black hole physics, to the available black hole, uh, sorry, to the available volume in the interior when some infalling observer jumps in at some given time. Now, uh, as far as I'm aware, and this was confirmed in, 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 uh, in Nicole's talk, uh, there is no precise quantum information formulation for this, uh, for the existence of this resource. Uh, one natural comment that comes about this was mentioned in the discussion afterwards, uh, uh, but it, it's a natural vague remark that one can make, is that in some of the uh, resource theories that are well established in the quantum information literature, uh, sorry, I don't pretend to be a, an expert, I, I'm just sharing the little that I know about this, uh, basically this is for people in my community, 
um, uh, there is there, there is a there is a resource related to 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 thermodynamics in which you basically allow your your observers to uh, apply arbitrary unitary operations this is what they call noise operations and the the analog of the free energy that measures uh, this this resource is what i have written here this is what we would uh, what we would call the distance the difference between the maximal entropy the here is the dimension of the hilbert space and this is the von neumann entropy of the given of the given entropy so 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 uh the 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 the, the reason i'm bringing this up is because if uh in your setup for a resource theory you allow for arbitrary unitaries this is what quantum information theories tell us that it's a good monotone so it's, it's a good free energy uh, and i guess that in our in our discussions uh, concerning um concerning circuit complexity we may be interested in considering in restricting this set of operations this is what i was stressing that which transformations you consider is important uh, to k local unitaries now whether you allow these k unitaries uh, k local unitaries to couple the different multipartite in your systems or not may be related to what geoffrey pennington was tell, was talking about between restricted and unrestricted complexity but clearly there is something there is something to be to be understood here uh, so i'm just mentioning since this is a multidisciplinary workshop i keep okay now uh so so uh more uh more precisely in, the, in this talk what i will type what i will try to to discuss are variations in complexity so before entering into any detail uh let me be quite explicit about sorry explicit uh, uh intuitively what is it that we will be looking at uh given some fixed reference state uh xi r and given some first target stakes it you can compute the complexity in whatever formulation that you have using nielsen or using holographic proposals uh, a natural thing to consider uh, is uh, especially given our ignorance or at least my ignorance on 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 this uh, reference stakes ir is to perturb the the target state let's call the resulting perturbation xi t plus delta xi compute the complexity there with the same prescription and take the difference uh, uh, one reason to do this as michael was already commenting uh, uh, in one of the questions to to Pavel's talk uh, this may be actually a uv finite quantity so, so that's an interesting thing to consider but in general uh, just to study the properties of this new observable uh, in the business now uh, so i hope that i i don't need to convince you that this seems like a natural question though of course complexity is a very as i'll try to stress as i move forward uh, is a different kind of beast uh, another motivation that we had which which has been appearing in in all the talks in in which there was a little bit of quantum circuit and holography is whether we can provide some bridge between let's say the the continuous formulation of Alan Nielsen and, and the volume or the action uh, uh, conjectures or any other whether we can provide any light on on the cost functions uh, as this was uh, mentioned in, in in Pavel's talk now if you are just uh, let's say a general relativity person uh, you've been given through these conjectures that I'll review in a second you've been given a couple of uh, new gauge invariant observables you may just be interested in studying the properties of, of, of these guys and whether there is any relation for instance with the first loss uh, in, in gravity using Walt. so I'll, I'll come back if I have time at, at the end of the talk and then uh, again let, let me just insist that um, if you view complexity like entanglement for instance uh, as a resource that allows you to do things uh, Com, uh, studying the variation in this magnitude or whatever magnitude that captures this concept uh, may be an interesting thing to do and as a reminder sorry for the triviality of this uh, this is what we do in thermodynamics or in entanglement uh, with the free energy and in that case what you are studying is the exchange of energy and, and information okay so uh, what i will try to do let's see time 
uh, uh, what I will try to do is uh, I'll do the proposals basically to set up notation, but I'll go very quickly because this has been this has been said. Then I will use Pavel's discussion connecting to geodesics to derive the first law because this just follows from classical mechanics. Then I'll, I'll discuss our uh, our idea on how to implement ADS CFT in this setup and attempt to bridge quantum circuit calculations with horographic calculations. I will report some of uh, our technical results in terms of uh, coherent states, which are the ones that we will study to actually do the calculations. And if I have time, which I hope uh, I will, I would like to end with some speculations regarding uh, resource theory and the world formalism uh, in gravity. Okay, so very quickly, uh, because really, uh, I thought I would do this because Rob's talk was already uh, two days ago or so, but, but, but Pavel uh, uh, already introduced this. One, one uh, geometric formulation of this uh, uh, complexity of formation uh, is consists in this continuum representation of the, unitary rep of the unitary transformations. So here H, I think I'm using the same notation as Pavel, is a linear combination of some gates um, and I will be referring to these capital Y functions, uh, control functions. And uh, as a function of this parameter sigma, which is the, the trajectory that you are following in the space of, of unitaries, this, this really becomes, if you give me some cost function that depends on the coordinates that you are using to parameterize the space of unitaries and the velocities, uh, this computes the, the cost or if you want to the length of this trajectory in some units, uh, using as, as, as boundary conditions, the fact that uh, when sigma is equal to, to, to zero, I am uh, the identity. So you are, if you think about it in terms of states, this means that you are, your state is your reference state. And then UT is, is the final unitary that reaches you the, the final trajectory. The, the, the only thing that I want you to take uh, home from here is that optimal in this formulation, which is continuous, optimal circuits get mapped to globally minimizing cost trajectories. And of course, there is a huge mathematical literature, as Pavel was stressing, uh, on, on, uh, on, on these matters. Now, uh, there is a choice of cost, which, is, which uh, we'll come back to it. But I also want to stress that in this, in this continuum formulation, um, the uh, perhaps it's better just to focus on these plots. The, the discreteness that you may expect complexity to have when you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, for instance, and you start playing around with Pauli matrices, so you have a finite number of spins. The complexity is, 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 has some discrete structure. But when you take this continuum formulation Alan Nielsen, you, you get some, some smooth. So what, what I have plotted here in the case of quantum mechanics on a circle is the complexity in terms, of, so one is labeling the, the states in terms of angles. I choose the reference state to be the angle zero. I choose my target space to be some other angle. And the, generate, and the gate is really generating some, some rotation. So you are literally moving around the circle. Uh, but your gate has some resolution delta theta. So if you want to do this exactly, this is where the notion of tolerance uh, is introduced. You declare that two states are close enough within some tolerance. And you, you can compute uh, what is the complexity. For instance, how many gates do I need to apply in order to get there? Now, uh, the, the technical point that, that I want to stress in order to prevent misunderstandings for, from some of the claims is that when you use this Nielsen formulation, this these functions that are multiplying your gates, they are actually treated like continuous real functions. So effectively, even though your uh, generator had, so, had some resolution delta theta, this is actually allowing you to consider arbitrary fractional insertions of gates. So this is why the answers in this formulation will look like the red lines, okay? Uh, Okay, now, uh, very quickly, which are the two proposals, holographic proposals that were made? First, uh, let, me, let me just set the notation for the complexity equals volume. 
Uh, in this case, you, you pick some you, you pick some Cauchy surface in the boundary. Let's say some constant time in, in the boundary. Uh, this is this 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 sigma, and you compute uh, the the maximal the maximal volume of of an extremal co-dimension one surface in the bulk that is anchored to that choice of time. Uh, there are things here that are very unclear, at least. To me, uh, uh, in any holographic dis uh, discussion, the role of the reference state is completely unclear, uh, at least to me. But in terms of uh, the target space, what we will be having in mind is always implicit in our discussions is, is, is some state, which may be already quite particular from the perspective of the overall Hilbert space, that has a gravity dual. Uh, and so what this means is that you have some classical configuration that solves some Einstein's equations coupled to some matter system. I will be denoting the metric by G and the remaining degrees of freedom by capital Phi. Think about it, some scalar field, for instance. Uh, because of units, this is volume, this is Newton's constant in whatever number of dimensions you are in. Uh, uh, the complexity is a dimensionless uh, quantity. Uh, we, are, we are off by one unit. So there is an arbitrary scale here. Uh, I don't have anything deep to say about this. So I, I will fix this to be the radius of curvature in, in ADS, like many people do. And uh, not that it will be important for this talk, but for, for, for the non-experts, the volume is really computed as the, given some coordinates parametrizing this, this co-dimension one surface uh, sigma, I, I'm basically pulling back the way to measure distances in space-time to that surface. And so the surface depends on a bunch of functions that parametrize how the surface is embedded in space-time. So that's the calculation that you do, that you are supposed to do in this case, and it depends on the background. And that background through ADS-CFT encodes information about the target space. Okay, what about the complexity equals action? Uh, in this case, uh, the the proposal is that the complexity action uh, is computed as follows: you need to evaluate some regulated version of the uh, of the Lorentzian action describing the, the dynamics of your system in a very specific region of space-time, which is called the uh, wheeler de uh, the wheeler de patch. Maybe I can go here. So what you do is, uh, this is some picture of uh, uh, ADS. You pick some, some time uh, at the boundary. T time flows upwards. So, so this is what I was denoting by sigma. So it is typically a, a sphere at some constant time. And then as Rob was explaining, you shoot uh, light rays and you basically, the Willard with patch is the domain of, uh, that is causally connected to this uh, T equals zero surface, let's say. Uh, in terms of calculations, this is what it's, what you typically usually do in ADS is that you have this, the, the, the boundary where I choose my Cauchy surface is this gray line, uh, but of course there are all sorts of infinities because this is some hyperbolic geometry, so, so distances uh, uh, blow up very close to the surface. So you introduce some cutoff, which is this red line. This epsilon is supposed to tell you where the cutoff is. The light rays are the blue ones, so this, this, this light rays define, eventually define the boundary of this wheeler the wheat patch, which is actually some sort of causal diamond, actually. And the geometry, the boundaries that appear in this picture is controlled by some, by some vectors, which technically are, are, are very important. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, let me still say that the issue of what is the reference state has not been clarified. I mean, uh, uh, and, and something that will be very important for us is the boundary of this wheel that we patch. And this boundary is controlled by these uh, vectors. Okay. Now, this is just to frighten people, uh, but also to highlight the important work. Uh, so in order to carry, I just want to give a feeling of what it is that you compute. Uh, so in order to carry the calculations in this second proposal, uh, uh, we will be following the, the prescription that was defined by, by, by this collaboration here, in which basically they use the the, the, the concept of having a well-defined variational principle when you are computing the action in, in some region of space-time that involves null boundaries and, possi and possibly also some 
some joints between the null boundaries and the cutting surfaces. So there are all sorts of important uh, details here. But another reason to stress this, uh, sorry for throwing so much information, is that there is this red term here, which is called the, 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 the counter term. Uh, this is important for gauge invariance, which depends on an arbitrary scale. Uh, uh, I'll comment on this uh, a little bit later. But basically, sorry, what you do is you have your target state, uh, you have your target uh, state. This has a gravity dual. This means that you have some on-shell configuration for the metric and whatever matter fields you have, this capital phi in this case, and you have to evaluate this expression here. So, so that's what the calculation is about. Okay, now uh, let me move to the first law. Uh, um, so using Nielsen's formulation, and given some cons some cost function, if I want to ask the question that I was formulating before, let me remind you uh, the picture. Maybe it's a better reminder than my words. You have some fixed reference state. You want to reach some uh, target state, and you want to uh, consider a different target state, and you want to consider the difference in complexity. Uh, since in the continuum formulation, this is mapped to a problem in classical mechanics where the standard Lagrangian is basically given by your choice of cost function. We know that this variation uh, is given by this expression here in terms of the, the distance. Uh, in I'm, I'm using the notation that this delta xa are parameterized in the space of unitaries. Remember that this is uh, the space where the trajectories take place. And by class, uh, from classical mechanics, we know that this variation is the inner product of this vector of variations times the analog of the conjugate momentum uh, in classical mechanics, which is defined in the standard way, replacing Lagrangian with cost functions. Uh, the point to stress is that this variation is evaluated at the end point. Now, historically, actual, actually, this was one of the reasons why we were interested in analyzing this quantity. Uh, personally, uh, remember that I have very little intuition about what this Xi R is, uh, and so we were hoping that these variations will be more sensitive to the information of the target uh, state and the surroundings, if you allow me to use that uh, very vague language, because it is in that setup that the holographic dictionary can, can actually teach you something. So uh, perhaps this is a better way of phrasing uh, our, our motivation. If we go to second order, again, from classical mechanics, the expression can still be computed in terms of information uh, at the end of the circuit uh, using these expressions here. Now, before I move on, uh, let me mention a, a, a caveat before anyone mentions it. Uh, actually, it, it, it's, it's an important one. When complexity by definition is minimal cost, that's what I was stressing when going over the Nielsen's formulation. Uh, and so this means that you are looking for some, for really the, the, the global minimum uh, geodesic, say, the optimal circuit that does the job for you. When you use these considerations in classical mechanics, uh, we're actually assuming that the, in technical terms, you are actually assuming that there are no conjugate points uh, uh, in the region nearby the endpoint of your initial target state. The, the, this is a point that, of course, that there is a huge mathematical literature. This is a well-known fact, but in the context of uh, complexity and holography, I, I think this is a point, for instance, that was stressed in BJ's talk, but definitely in, in the paper that they that they wrote about uh, the study of uh, of random Hamiltonians. Now, uh, when we are considering these first law considerations, we are definitely assuming that there is a family of globally minimi minimizing circuits. And so the balance equation that this first law is providing for you uh, uh, is, is only capturing the right answer if there is no this disruption due to global considerations in, in, in the first law. So th this is something that, that, that you need to keep in mind. Uh, for the peace of your mind, uh, let me tell you that in the cases in which I will report the answers, we have checked that this is the case, but this will not always be the case. 
So global issues uh, will, will be important. Now, uh, so all this was fairly abstract, actually fairly cheap. Uh, once you have the huge insight by Nielsen, uh, let me check time. Uh, okay, so how, how are we going to come up with some holographic setup in which we will try to compare between the three, the three different uh, objects that we have introduced, Nielsen, volume, and action. Uh, sorry, if this, sorry if this is technical for the people not in my community. Actually, I, I'm trying to convey a little bit of some of the language uh, so that things don't look terribly confusing. Uh, so, so the idea that, that, we are, that we are going to use is, I believe it's, it's, it's relatively simple. Uh, we will introduce some cutoff uh, so that our quantum field has a finite number of degrees of freedom. It will be a free quantum field. I, I will uh, explain uh, this in a, in a second. So you should think about, about this as having a, a, a large number, but finite number of uh, quantum harmonic oscillators. These harmonic oscillators have annihilation and creation operators I'm trying to use the, the same notation as usual with some non-trivial amplitude. This is what having a, a quantum field will do for us. And the kinds of uh, uh, reference, uh, both reference states are, and target states that I'm going to consider are going to be coherent states. So this means in terms of quantum mechanics that uh, these, these states, uh, the, the vacuum actually, and the, the excitation states are going to be obtained by the action of, of this operator, as in quantum mechanics, in terms of this complex uh, parameter alpha, J labels the quantum number. And uh, as you know, the advantage of this coherent state is that the expectation value in these coherent states of your quantum operator equals the classical expectation value of your field. That's the object that solves the classical equations of motion that's the object that I was uh, alluding to. This is how I will compute action, for instance. So uh, the purpose of this, of this slide is just to convey the following information. The target state that I will be having in mind will be the vacuum. Uh, in ADS, this means global ADS. And in terms of the matter fields, this means that vanishing expectation value for the scalar field. And the excitation, the perturbation, is going to be some a small amplitude which I will denote by epsilon in terms of this parameter alpha. And I will keep track of this information by solving the wave equation in global ADS. Um, okay, I hope that this is clear, but we'll, we'll get there. Now, the, the conceptual idea for, for the experts, this should be clear, uh, but, but let, let me still stress this for, for people outside of, of my community. The, the idea that we will try to follow to bridge quantum circuits with uh, holography, uh, or to try to, is the fact that we have that you have already heard in in, in many of the previous talks that uh, ADS-CFT is is a statement, of course, a, a quantified statement about the fact that you have two Hilbert spaces that are isomorphic. So you have a conformal field theory with some Hilbert space. I have some quantum gravity in ADS, whatever that means, that has some Hilbert space. Both of them uh, uh, should have the same Hilbert space if the correspondence is correct. And in some limits, we have a way of describing approximate descriptions of these states in both sides of the correspondence. And this is precisely what, what I would like to use. Uh, the vacuum and the excitations generated by the, these uh, free quantum harmonic oscillators are uh, give rise to excitations in the bulk, which I can also equivalently describe as coherent states in the boundary theory. This is an explicit statement in some particular case of the isomorphism of Hilbert spaces. The second remark is more for experts, sorry. Uh, but I will be discussing these coherent states in both cases. And technically, but this is also important for me to stress the, the work done in the literature, what we will do is the following. We will be using the seminal work by uh, Jefferson and, uh, and Myers on developing the Nielsen technology for quantum field theory. Uh, this was later uh, applied to coherent states by 
by this collaboration. And what we will do is, well, since the coherent states in the boundary theory are equivalently described in terms of these three quantum harmonic oscillators in the bulk, we will be uh, using the quantum circuit technology using a quantum bulk scalar field in global ADS. I'll make a remark about whether this is the right thing to do or not. And in the gravity dual, I will be using uh, the, the volume and the action prescriptions that, that, that I tried to very quickly review earlier and that have been developed technically by, by a lot of people. This is just a very biased set of, of names. So that's a little bit the logic of what's going to happen uh, in, the, in the coming minutes. Uh, I hope I've conveyed a little bit of uh, that motivation. Or the setup. Now, uh, I think that this will be the last caveat, but just being honest. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, let me check time. Okay, so. so maybe uh, like another 10 minutes or so, if it's possible. Yeah, yeah, uh, this is why I was a little bit worried with myself. Uh, but uh, I am even. Yeah, I am a slow speaker, sorry. Okay, but uh, the, 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 coming, the important thing is that you, you know what we did, then I, I'll report the answers. Now, some of you may be, and, and probably correctly, concerned about the fact that our suggestion to compare the volume and the action calculations uh, involves a quantum circuit uh, of free quantum fields in ADS, where the information about the geometry is already encoded in a curved background. You know, this is an effective field theory in the bulk, in some fixed background. So the quantum gates, uh, we definitely expect that they will generate the, the coherent excitations that I was talking about. This, is, this, this should be clear. But it's far from clear that our calculation encodes any information about the generation of space-time itself, which is precisely, in my opinion, what, for instance, uh, Pavel was trying to stress uh, concerning how do I use stress tensors in the CFT in order to understand how to generate geometry? So the reason I'm bringing this caveat is because even though I'm using the isomorphism of Hilbert spaces, uh, I have already told you that the variation in the, in, from first principles, the variation in the circuit complexity using the Nielsen formulation uh, only depends on, on, the, on data at the end of the circuit. But it may well be that when I, that even that in my approximation of using free quantum fields in ADS, that end of the circuit that I'm actually considering in this approximation is not capturing the information about the how global ADS was generated. So uh, this is of course a potentially important caveat. Therefore, I just expect to get some kind of qualitative comparison between these calculations, but this was our attempt, and I'm just being honest about what it is. Now, before telling you the, the, uh, our results, uh, the calculation is, is fairly technical, as, as you can imagine, uh, but uh, let me remind you what we did. Uh, uh, this is the variation that we computed. Our initial target state is some G0, which is global ADS in, some, in any number of dimensions. The scalar field has vanishing expectation value. And the perturbed state includes the second order uh, back reaction of the scalar field on the metric and the vacuum expectation value, the small amplitude of our coherent states. Now, what is the structure, before even attempting to do any calculation, what is the structure of the answer that you should get? Uh, there are typically three pieces in the holographic side. Uh, I have denoted them here by, by these three different symbols. Uh, but, but the intuition should be clear. There are some pieces like this one which capture the information on the perturbation of the metric and, and, and the matter field in the undeformed wheeler that we patch. Remember that this is a calculation in which the input depends on which metric you are in, but you are also integrating over some region of space time. So when you do this calculation at second order, there is a contribution from the perturbation in the undeformed wheeler that we patch. But there are also contributions from the fact that the deformed geometry, if you shoot light rays in that deformed geometry, those light rays are modified a little bit. Therefore, there is also a contribution from the modification of the region of integration. That's what this second term is trying to capture. 
And then if you want, if you want to be technically careful, you also need to worry whether uh, uh, the, the, the cutoff regularization in the perturbed uh, metric uh, changes or not. There is a very similar discussion for the volume. Let me not go over the same three pieces, uh, the same kind of encoding of information. So what I would like to discuss now is what are the differences uh, between these two answers? Because uh, there is always this issue of, uh, do you also get the same answer for volume action? Okay. So in a nutshell, and after a lot of pain, at least on my side, and maybe my collaborators did this more easily, uh, 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 in the case of uh, conformal dimensions larger than the halves, sorry for the technical, this is just for experts, uh, when we remove the cutoff, what, what we see is that the contribution from the joint pieces and the gibbons hawking your term uh, vanishes. But it's interesting only for global ideas that the, all the contributions from the gravitational piece of the action uh, vanish. If you take these three contributions on their own, they give rise to finite pieces which involve integrals in the boundary of the undeformed wheeler with patch. So th this seems to resonate. Of course, this follows basically from first principles because you're, you have a well-defined variational principle. Uh, but we only get a contribution from the, from the matter sector as an integral in the boundary of the wheeler the with patch. Since I'm running out of time, what do I want to stress? This is a highlight of these points. Uh, this answer is UV finite and is independent of the arbitrary scale that appears in the action, which is something that I don't physically understand what is the meaning of this scale. But this scale is removed when I actually uh, compute this variation. Uh, the, the, the appearance of the counter term piece is actually very important for this cancellation, as you can see from this equation. All these three pieces are actually different from zero. And independently of the cancellation, let me stress, like in Barbon's paper, uh, in, in Barbon's talk, uh, he was talking about the volume variation. Uh, in, in the action case, it can also be written as, as an integral over the boundary of the wheel that we touched. Uh, so, so this is, of course, very similar to what happens in the Nielsen's formulation. Now, uh, um, I can ask a question, maybe. Oh, of course, yeah, oh. of course, of course. Uh, so, um, when you add this counter term, what uh, what are the assumptions you're making about the background that you're using? Uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm I'm not making any assumption. The the the, the term is for for any background. So, if you would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th does this answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, if we do. Uh, if uh, before entering into the actual details, uh, if, if we compute the, the, the volume variation, uh, uh, what we get is, well, basically we reproduce the answer in the nice paper by Alex and, and collaborators. I also want to stress, because if I have time, I'll come back to this. Uh, we, the, the, the answer that uh, Ted and, 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 and Beezer obtain as, as the first law of causal diamonds, when you take the limit of a, uh, of, of an infinite causal diamond is also reproduced. So this is basically an integral at some constant uh, TS slice of some uh, bulk stress tensor. So it has some energy interpretation. Uh, there is a nice discussion here on, on the meaning of this, uh, but I'll come back to, to this connection uh, in a few minutes. The answers uh, can be written in this way to ease the, the comparison. So, so these are, these are second order in the perturbations. Uh, holographically, th th this, is, this is quite clear. They are both uh, oscill oscillatory. Uh, you may be worried about why you get something oscillatory when everyone talks about linear growth. Uh, but I remind you that, uh, that massive particles in, in global ADS actually do perform uh, oscill oscillatory motion. So the answer is for global ADS uh, should, should have this sinusoidal behavior. Now, wh wh what is important is that is what is the behavior of these coefficients. So I will be denoting them by Carly C and Carly S. And whether they carry an A or B, it means that I'm referring to volume answers or action answers. And this is where we get uh, important differences that I would like to, to, to highlight. Just because the, the, the setup that we have here 
is, is extremely natural. We are not considering any extremely complicated uh, perturbation. We are just turning on some, some coherent state in a small amplitude. So the variation in the action is always, posi is always positive. Uh, the variation in the volume is typically positive, but as the experts know, since the mass of a scalar field in anti uh, can actually be tachyonic, uh, and the variation of the volume depends on the integral of the stress tensor. There is a very small window of uh, quantum numbers for which actually the variation in the volume is negative. Okay, I don't have anything deep to say about that, uh, but uh, that's, th that's a difference. Perhaps more strikingly is the fact that in the, the action variation, uh, when you consider some coherent state, which is a linear superposition of modes, and you have interference terms, uh, it's still true that the dominant contributions come from the diagonal and, and the, oscill the, the amplitude of the oscillations is of the same order as the diagonal terms. Now, the diagonal terms is for large quantum number j, a scale like log of j divided by j. Uh, whereas when I go to the volume, this is still also diagonal dominated. Actually, the, the subleading uh, contributions are much more subdominant here. But what I want to stress, because of lack of time, is that the behavior at large j is very different. So uh, uh, clearly, uh, whatever it is that we are, whatever it is that the two proposals uh, mean, uh, they are giving very different answers for these perturbations. And I do want to highlight that differences between action and volume have been uh, reported in the literature uh, before. Uh, this is just a, perhaps a more flagrant uh, difference. Okay, uh, I will be struggling with that. We started at a quarter pass, right? Okay, but in any case, I should uh, rush. Okay, uh, now, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah no, just uh, sort of, uh, yeah. Wrap. This is just to let you know that I, I, I am aware. <laughs> I am aware of that, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so, so uh, okay, we still have to talk about quantum gates, but I'll rush very quickly over that. So. Even before uh, getting into the, I thought it could be uh, useful before making any remarks about quantum gates, the fact that the holographic answers are second order in the perturbations, so second order in the amplitudes. So if you remember our general statement about the variation of complexity Alan Nielsen, what we are learning is that the first order variation is zero. So the inner product of this momentum with the variation in delta x has to vanish. So we are learning that the, 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 the gates that are responsible for generating this expectation value have to be orthogonal to the direction in which the initial global ADS uh, state uh, is generated. Okay, uh, so that's, that's just a remark. Okay, so quantum circuits. I think I will just go very quickly, sorry. Uh, not so quickly. Uh, a reminder, this is what we want to do. Uh, all our states are coherent states. I will be using, I will be using the technology uh, from these papers and we extend it a little bit, but that's not important at this point. Remember that I will introduce a cutoff. This is why I have a finite number of uh, harmonic oscillators. And because of this business of cost functions, which, which Pavel has alluded to, I, I, I will be reporting answers for two choices. I don't have any intelligent remark about which choices, which cost functions should I use. Uh, I think there is a nice critical discussion on choice of cost functions in this paper by Pablo, Javier, and, and Carlos. Uh, so I encourage you to, to look at them. Now, to give you a little bit of a flavor, though uh, I think that because of lack of time, this is a mistake. Uh, let me just show you how, how these gates uh, look like. Uh, this, you know, Pavel was using the stress tensor as, as many of, uh, and some other people have been using these operators. We will be using the, the modes, you know, the, the X's and P's of our harmonic oscillators. It's just that I'm using the, the phi modes and the pi modes of my scalar field. But the idea is that you consider unitaries where epsilon is, the, is some small parameter. Now, what I want to highlight is that in the absence of excitations, uh, the, the gates that generate the vacuum, say, are, 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 the, are, are all belonging to this family. And when you define these gates, there is the possibility of introducing some 
when you define the reference state, the reference state may depend on an arbitrary fundamental frequency. If you think in terms of the wave function, there will be some dependence on the frequency of that reference state. And when you define this gate, there are other dimensionless scales that you could use. So, so you, you expect that the answer will depend on some numbers. It will have apparently more structure because of this choice in, in, in these scales than the one in holography. So we, we shouldn't be completely discouraged if the answer looks very different. Uh, perhaps just to highlight that if you want to generate some non-trivial expectation value in one of your harmonic oscillators, you will need to include these extra gates. Uh, you can see their action here. And this also involves these arbitrary uh, shifts uh, quantities. The full set of gates that we consider closes this, this, this group. And as I was saying, the answer will depend on the data that, the, that defines the reference state for us and the dimensionless gate scales. OK, so how does the answer look like? I've written it in a way, uh, oof, I've written it in a way that uh, resembles our previous answer. So same notation, second order in amplitude perturbations, uh, oscill oscillatory behavior, and the coefficients look like this. This is the frequency that I was talking about, about the reference state, is this, this mu dependence, and omega is basically the energy of the mode, so essentially J as before. F is information on the gate scale of defining the, the operators that I have just defined. Now, I just want to highlight uh, perhaps depressing results, I don't know, you, you choose. Uh, it's obvious that the answer is second order, that's not terribly surprising. Um, now, let me highlight that uh, one difference is that the quantum field theory calculation, even if I consider a linear superposition of modes, uh, the answer at second order is only given by a diagonal contribution, so there are no interference terms. The good news in that respect is that in the holographic calculation, there are of diagonal terms, but they are uh, typically subleading for large quantum numbers. Uh, even though the time dependence looks the same, uh, I actually want to, to report that, that the, the two time dependences, meaning when you actually take into account the energy dependence of the modes in my coherent state excitation, it's not the same. Uh, I, I can elaborate on this uh, perhaps in a few minutes, uh, sorry, in the question session. And, and indeed, the answer depends on, on, on some scales. Okay, now let me go to... Uh, so what I have tried to, to report here is, uh, I think that I, uh, as some other speakers have already done, I, I've tried to highlight that uh, complexity is definitely very important for, for, for black holes. Uh, hopefully there is no doubt about that. But that such notion uh, is, is more general. Um, um, you know, as in Bartek's talk, uh, you know, it's a natural question, what is the complexity of a given state? And it, it's, it's very important, I think, to, to understand how to quantify these things. Uh, and, and so we had the idea of studying, like in any other observable in physics, variations of this new observable, if you allow me to use the word observable. The way in which I view our first law, modulo the global caveat that I share with you, is, is as a balance equation, and I will come back to this before the end of the talk. Uh, we try to come up with some way of coming up with computable variations both in the quantum circuit and in the holographic proposals. We have seen uh, important differences in the variation of the action and the variation of the volume for these coherent states. Uh, the matching with the quantum circuit uh, unfortunately requires much more understanding and this is related to, 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 to Pavel's talk. And I, will want, I want to highlight, just as, uh, as, as Jose Barbon mentioned, that the variation of the volume is, is, is a boundary term, that the same is true for the boundary action. Now, uh, the cancellation that I reported in the gravitational sector um, does not generically hold when you consider non-spherical perturbations or you turn on sources. Uh, so th th there was, uh, we, we knew this, but there was a very nice paper by, by by this collaboration in which they actually push the gravitational calculation for arbitrary background. So I encourage you to have a look at, uh, at that paper. Uh, now, this is an attempt at, at highlighting that there is a lot of, of things to be understood and that we probably didn't take into account the generation of the metric 
using the CFT stress tensor, so it, it could be nice to to put together uh, the efforts of the community in that direction with with uh, our description of the matter excitations, which is definitely easier. I would also like to point out very briefly, uh, sadly, uh, I was debating whether to put more time on this, that uh, sometimes in the literature, I guess that for, you know, for experts, this is obvious, but uh, our ideas also apply in, term of, in terms of operator growth. You could compare the complexity uh, between some target states uh, and some perturbation of the target state as, as time evolves. And if the perturbation is small enough, you expect the answer uh, for this cost to be related to the cost of growing your operator. And, and that is indeed so, so, something that you, that you can make manifest. Now, to, to close the, 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 the talk, I, I was asked to, to, to mention some more speculative remarks or, or at least uh, you know, things that I find potentially interesting but that I definitely don't understand. Uh, this doesn't mean that I understand complexity. I don't understand what I've been talking about in the first 55 minutes of my talk. But what I'm going to say now is even more confusing. So, so I'm trying to fulfill the organizer's request. So uh, the first observation is probably very minor because all of you know this. Uh, because of the connection of uh, Nielsen with classical mechanics, as soon as anyone tells you that uh, they are using some set of gate operators that close some algebra. Uh, since the problem of classical mechanics is in the space of unitaries, uh, and the metric that you use in complexity is invariant under right multiplication, it follows by, by Netter's theorem that that very complicated problem, uh, it has a set of conserved charges. These are the Virasoro charges uh, in Pavel's talk, when you consider the stress tensor and the Virasoro group. But in my talk, for instance, you know, there are as many charges as, as the generators of the group that we were considering. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, any, any, cal any object, any variation that I have computed can, can be written in terms of these charges uh, and the variations of the parameters. Now, uh, having in mind that that in, in the case of uh, Pavel is, is, is probably more explicit that these charges are the Virasoro charges. Uh, perhaps this is a way of, uh, 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 in some cases outside of two dimensions, to, 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 to connect uh, whatever transformations we are doing or the tensor network picture with, with a more geometric realization of these issues. This, this may be a red herring, but I'm just sharing. And what I find perhaps a little bit more precise, but I'll let you do this side, is, and with this I will really finish, uh, is uh, using the language of uh, Nicole's talk, I could rephrase what we typically devote, uh, sorry, denote by black, black hole thermodynamics in the language of resource theory. So Nicole was telling us uh, we have a bunch of free states, which are basically the density matrices of a fixed temperature. In the gravity language, we have a bunch of black holes or saddles. Uh, the resourceful, resourceful states are any density matrix that doesn't have the same temperature as the black hole. In the formulation of our world, say, uh, you would be considering a small uh, on-shell variations of the of your black hole background, let's call this uh, delta phi. In the quantum information literature and in resource theory, it's very important which is the subset of transformations that you can that, that you can access for free. Uh, in the, in that case, these are the energy preserving transformations. And please notice that in, when you derive the first law of a world, what you do is you remind yourself that you have a killing vector that leaves your saddle invariant, so it's, it's, it's a killing vector, but it's not necessarily a killing vector of, of, the, of the variation. Uh, and then to quantify the resource, uh, the people in resource theory use, for instance, the relative entropy between the resourceful raw state and the free state, which is the thermal state. And what we do in gravity, as you guys know, is the difference in the on-shell action. This is the, the, the free energy. Now, uh, this may look like a relatively cheap dictionary, uh, but but actually, when you when you when you think about it, 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 this has to be more general. For instance, if you look at 
at the connection that Lashkarian collaborators did between relative entanglement entropy and causal wedge. There is a completely the, the same dictionary that you can come that you come up with. You pick a region of a subregion of your boundary theory. And then the transformations that you consider in that case, these vector fields, are vector fields that preserve the causal, the causal wedge. So your psi has to fall off so that you preserve the causal wedge. Using the walls technology, this gentleman derives some pseudo energy, which is what controls the difference in the entanglement entropy. Uh, so I'm just highlighting that there is a general formulation for first laws for uh, resource theories that our colleagues in quantum information have developed, whereas in gravity we have this world. And perhaps just to close, and I promise this is the last one, um, uh, I find, especially after having heard uh, uh, Jose's talk, uh, Barbon's talk, um, that our result uh, there, there is a nice connection with with Alex's work, of course, but but, but uh, 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 perhaps I, I want to stress a little bit more the connection, the possible connection with Jacobson and, and, and Bezos's work. In their work, they derive a first law independent of any complexity considerations, just from the perspective of let's say causal diamonds. And they realize that these causal diamonds are left, these are pieces of space time, which are left invariant by the action of conformal killing vectors. Now, this, I would like to interpret these conformal killing vectors as a subset of transformations that define a resource theory. That, that, that's a non-trivial claim to make, uh, but that's how these objects enter into these discussions. And please notice, I, I just added this yesterday, that in the nice talk by Barbon, when he was uh, relating the time variation of the complexity uh, with some notion of momentum, he was also projecting uh, the, the bulk stress tensor. And you need, you need to project that using some uh, conformal killing vector and the analog of this S, which is just telling you which surface you are considering. So with this uh, uh, speculations on whether there is a general relation. So, you know, perhaps what I've been talking about today has nothing to do with uh, the computer science notion of, uh, of uh, quantum complexity, uh, I don't know. Uh, but clearly uh, it seems that just from a purely uh, GR perspective, there, there, there are, there are questions linking the variation of the volume, for instance, uh, with uh, standards, standard first laws. And with this, I finish. Sorry, thanks. Okay, let's all unmute. Thank you for the very nice talk. All right, so now are there any questions? So maybe I can uh, ask. Um, so what? Uh, so what can you uh, say from this uh, game about the uh, the reference state in holography? What kind of insight uh, can you gain about? Uh, maybe some other people have something uh, deep or interesting to say, but. Uh, uh, I could ask this question myself. Uh, uh, I, I think, well, I'm even sorry to, to refer to him, but uh, you know, since Jan intervened before, I, I view this as a very mysterious uh, object in holography. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I can tell you, I was rushing that in our quantum circuit calculations, this is an unentangled state, blah, 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 of course, but, but uh, I mean, I guess that one of the deep issues, uh, if these proposals are correct, is that somehow the volume and the action are, when you compute them, so if you accept these holographic uh, prescriptions, uh, they are already encoding the generation of this space time. Maybe people that have more intuition in terms of tensor networks could, could elaborate on this. But uh, in short, um, I, the reference state in holography remains uh, completely unknown to me. 
Uh, and I have to say, I'm just being honest, that one reason for me to consider these variations was actually a, an attempt at ignoring as much as possible where I started the discussion, which is the reference state, and focus on the endpoint of the initial circuit, because this is the one that we seem to understand uh, better, even independently of complexity. You know, I'm giving you a state, uh, we have all sorts of checks, we have all sorts of observables that we could compute there. And so th th this is actually, but, but in short, I'm, I don't have anything to offer, I'm sorry. So I have a question. Uh, uh, please. Hi, Joan. Uh, hi, Pepe. So uh, in this um, discussion, when you compare uh, the answers from volume and action, uh, yes. you highlighted the log, log of J over J. Yes. Is this log coming ultimately from the expansion counter term or not? Uh, you are referring to the holographic calculation at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. You made yeah, this point so, that uh, yeah. the amplitudes yes. uh, were scaling different in volume and in action. There, there. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so uh, unfortunately, well, I, I don't know where you may be coming from, but uh, so, so in our setup, uh, and sadly, uh, so in the holographic answer, the the log of J is actually coming from, from the matter contribution, if you allow me to use that, because even though the counter term gives rise to a finite contribution, it, it actually gets canceled. Uh, so the, this piece here, this is the one that you are asking me. Yeah. The, this piece here is finite and, and, and you know, of the record, I, I, I can tell you how it looks like but its contribution gets actually canceled by the Einstein Hilbert and the Kappa term. So actually this log J technically speaking comes from, from the, uh, the asymptotic behavior of, of some harmonic functions, uh, sorry, the harmonic number that control, yeah. But it comes from the matter set, oh, sorry, that's the short answer. So it could have been nice if there could be some RG interpreted, but yeah, I don't know, maybe you have some insights, but it, it's not coming from the counter term in our case. Yeah. So do you see any, any um, way of interpreting the physical meaning of the expansion counter term uh, from this analysis? I mean, uh, I consider the, the expansion counter term mysterious. I don't know if you... I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> It's, it, it's amazing that the word mysterious has appeared in my talk several times. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the short answer is no. I mean, as you know, from the GR perspective, this term comes from requiring gauge, gauge invariance uh, when, when Poisson and company started adding these extra counter terms the they you you need to you you need this extra piece in order to keep gauge invariance of the entire object that has a well defined uh, variational principle so, so 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 there is this understanding technical understanding that you would like that action to be gauge invariant but from a quantum field theory perspective which is i think what you are asking uh, i guess that uh what what, what what I could do is to, to try to look at the specific contribution that this term is giving in our case to, to see whether it has any interesting behavior about which piece of physics is trying to give. But I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any, this is a very good question. Yeah, the, the counter term piece is, is confusing but interesting because it involves this arbitrary scale. Uh, and so I hope that eventually someone will will be able to to say something more more physical about it okay so i think um it might be a good time to move on to this discussion if there are any more questions we can discuss um more there um so let's uh unmute again and and thank you on